tasty. Nowadays, everybody's got to make, you know, they got that child tax. Holy oh, smokes, look at it, huh? Of course. It's really nice, you know? It's still not crystal clear. You know that our people are getting that. One of my dear has 10 children. He's only about 33. Getting there, there, Chaz? <laughs> no. <laughs> and, <laughs> no. Chaz looks like a guy that's been cut off. No, okay. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> Just give me a chance. <laughs> no idea what I'm talking about. I can play that song, it'll give you some energy. <laughs> you do this, uh, I. Oh, He drives all the way to Victoria, Coloma, Whitehorse, watch his friends on the playoff. <laughs> Whitehorse, too. 
I think there's not. Yeah, I think they have couches there and everything. Wait, see him you get. See your man up. Kabul school. Toysum, uh, a nitsum, faxum, a mahil tun. Talk to Saddam. Nine plum yets. Niski menu. The magad loam. Thank you, Robert. Samogniski Menu. Opening words and thoughts on, on those that are closed in and not able to be. So we have an agenda in front of us. Um, just to let you all know, uh, Vernon uh, Salomiro is not able to be here. Uh, he's en route back. I believe he's in Prince George. And, uh, so he's not able to be here today. Um, 10 o'clock, introductions. 10.15, review notes of last meeting. June 12th, uh, 11.30. Uh, jurisdiction, working group sessions, access to fish tenure 2020, season uncertain. One o'clock, established tribunal, Ayok, federal and provincial, protect individual rights, fairness by legislation, and Ayok. Number six, other, next CMT meeting, date August, and then closing prayer. Robert Campbell, any uh, additions to the agenda? None will do with the number two. We're really ahead of schedule here. <laughs> We're early. Um, do introductions. <coughs> I'm sure we know each other, but won't hurt. Or Brian Williams, uh, Samogit Guyer, Ishas from Kispiox, chairperson today. 
for the uh, crisis management team. Kurt Wilson, um, we will look uh, Wolf and Faya, pick you up. Gordon Sebastian, Luke and Hughes, Roxanne, Froggy. Mishimu, given name Robert Campbell. Prasash, name Councilman Spadio. Good morning, everybody. Um, Chaz Ware, Gitsan Environmental Services, uh, technical advisor to the Gitsan government. Good morning. Robin Alexander, Gwish Gen, Disgask, Gutiniqua. <coughs> Norman Moore. Um, uh, okay, I've got a name. Uh, Nola, on, on Good Max. And, um, both on on um, Gitchukla. Uh, they're both the heads of the, each village. Uh, uh, Juanita Rogers, DFO Aboriginal Programs. And good morning, it's Amy Wakelin, the DFO in Prince Rupert, North Coast. Maybe we can just introduce our uh, our camera crew, our communications group. Um, there is Hello, and I'm the, the lead, the graphic and video lead. Uh, Connor Smith, I'm learning. I'm the John Clark, I'm Matthews. Alex Stoney. Christopher Alexander. He's not part of the camp crew, but he's. <laughs> <laughs> also want to acknowledge uh, Gidden Waldo's territory and Gidden Max. No? Not Nick correct? Nick and Aid? Nola. Nola? Nola. Yeah. Okay. He's the main one. Nola. Okay. Thank you for the correction. So we've got our notes from the last meeting, uh, sort of the minutes, meeting notes. So two pages. Anything that we have recorded improperly, let us know. Quickly read through it. Yeah, just quickly review it and uh, oh, if there's anything that oh, okay. uh, is not uh, recorded correctly and then uh, we can uh, make note of those changes. <coughs> good. 
Any business arising from the notes, meeting notes? So I, I, I wanted to note that um, I think we've been exchanging emails regarding, um, what's his name again? Darren. And Urs. Yeah, so Darren Chow is our, um, is our recreational fishery manager. Yes. And then Urs Thomas is the chair of the okay. Northern SFA Committee. C. I always get the C's and B's mixed up. Okay. Um, so yeah, so we've been trying to figure out logistics, I guess. Right, right. So our emails indicated that uh, we're looking at a, another date to uh, potentially meet with Urs um, and uh, Chow. Darren, yeah. Darren. And um, a brief conversation Juanita and I had uh, regarding um, a phone in. Uh, our preference would be to have a face to face meeting, and uh, I think we both agreed to that. And uh, so we're going to look at a, 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 a future date. I think the date that was looked at was 22nd or. The week of the 22nd is the next time after this week that Earth is available to come over. Okay. Yeah. And before that time, he was looking forward to having a, a small, short conversation with a couple of you about planning the agenda and so that he could prepare for the meeting. Okay. So I think they'll also probably, it might not just be Earth, I think each of the, the local uh, SFA. Bees, like the boards have their own chair and so there's a chair in Smithers, a chair in Terrace and so likely I think it would be if we could find a date where they could all attend um, it would be useful and with yeah. Urs kind of being the lead. Okay. So just to but they want they did want to talk about the agenda and what like what so they could prepare themselves and be ready for the conversation and any background materials and stuff like that so. I think the intention of the first meeting would be just an introduction yeah. just to get an understanding of both sides, yeah. what what we're all looking at, uh, what our concerns are, and we would, our chiefs would uh, point that out to um, the sports fishing representatives, and then uh, look at what they're, they're proposing. We're not proposing, but what they're looking at. Interaction. Yeah, yeah. Um, would it be useful to you, I wonder, uh, if there would be interest in uh, them kind of explaining how their process works oh, for getting done. advice? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. What are you guys talking about? <laughs> the potential on uh, meetings with the um, sports fishermen. Oh. Yeah. So. Uh, and you're talking about this group? Yes. Oh, okay. I'm talking about you. <laughs> <laughs> Specifically. Specifically. I thought that you guys were talking no, about no. chairs meeting chairs. No, 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 no. no. Um, it's 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 to meet with the sports fishermen uh, chair chairpersons, along with the um, the uh, crisis management team. More of an introduction on uh, process. We their, would, their process. Their process yeah. and what. What, what we think our process is. Um, I shouldn't say what we think, what we know our process is. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So at the last meeting, we were hopeful that we might actually be able to do that today. And um, it was just really challenging to get Earth off the islands <laughs> and get ferries booked for him from how to fly. Uh, the other three reps are more local, could travel in a couple of hours. So we were thinking that if we could share with them the concepts of what a future meeting would look like uh, and make sure that the four of them are available soon, we could do this again in the summer. The one, uh, the one question that, uh, that Darren had for me when I talked to him is if there was flexibility uh, for an evening meeting, an evening meeting or a weekend. Um, our SFAB reps are largely volunteers. Well, they are all volunteers and they have day jobs. Um, so for some of them, it's a little tricky to get time off from their regular work to, to, to volunteer for their SFAB duties. Um, so they wanted to know if there could be some, if that was an option. It's very flexible. Okay, and awesome. I mean, just uh, 
recording him a contact person? Yeah. So I think maybe that's what the action might be is if, if you guys and we'll continue our email exchange and get the details. I think that uh, we should be included with those emails. Okay. Yeah, because um, we come here and then we learn it second yeah. hand. Yeah. So we, we, I think that uh, everyone sitting here would like to be included with the emails. Okay. Okay. So the action plan is to is to look at specific dates in the very near future and a bit of a conversation on what the agenda is going to to look like. Okay. And so you're proposing the week of the. 22nd? That was the next possible if we couldn't make today or Saturday work, which we couldn't uh, on either one, unfortunately. So then first is committed for another week of, of, of meetings. And so after the 22nd was the first next time. Um, so it's, it's really flexible beyond that. Yeah, the ferry schedule is such the ferry comes over Saturday nights, Thursday nights, and Tuesdays, I think, or something like that. It's a few times a week. There's about three times a week that the ferry comes over. <laughs> so it almost it almost seems that we may need to come to some central location or even come to Rupert. Or I'm just thinking out loud. Yeah, we'd have a rep like there'd be a rep from Smithers, Terrace and Rupert. Um, and then Earth coming over from from Hidegwai. I think there's always value in coming to the territory. Terrace, Terrace could work if that works for you guys, yeah. but you yeah. know, I'm always. Terrace is pretty central. Okay. We could do it there. Okay. Any other thoughts? I think you guys should find Terrace. <laughs> <laughs> we remember what happened last time. <laughs> but those were Gordon's directions, so. <laughs> Communication crew couldn't find where we were at. <laughs> oh no. The, the directions were in minutes. So you travel down the highway for 45 minutes. So I'm not uh, sure uh, how fast Gordon drives. Did but... he say speed? No. <laughs> yeah. Once we hit the flag, we. <laughs> See, now we're looking for the flag. Now I know where it is. Every time I pass, I'm like, there it is. <laughs> I know it's between uh, kilometer 210 and 215. Okay, now we're done. <laughs> yeah. <That's... laughs> those are permanent markers. Yeah. <laughs> it was a fun day. <laughs> uh, okay, thank you. Um, any other business from the minutes? Any further discussion or from any of the same to get minutes? Canada? Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Um, we're now into 11.30. We are speedy. Okay. Oh, okay, I'm fine. We're going to take a little longer because we've got lunch coming in. <laughs> so, so just to kill a couple of minutes um, I, I see this news uh, um, release I uh, wonder if you can shed any light on it Amy well I can't speak to exactly if this is 100% correct um, but what I can tell you <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So um, there are a couple things going on right now. So the Skeena River watershed limits are uh, currently proposed to be uh, two per day for Chinook um, with only one over 65 uh, inches. Um, the Skeena main stem area closures uh, continued at the mouth of the Kitsum Kalum, the Kitwanga and the Kispiox. 
And so those sections are actually no fishing completely. The, the province actually mirrored DFO's uh, measures this year. Last year we had those areas closed uh, to no fishing for salmon. Um, but from an enforcement perspective, that caused some confusion because uh, people were still able to go in there and fish for trout and, and things like that <coughs> steelhead. Um, and so uh, this year, those are actually no fishing uh, in those areas. The trips and lakes of the Skeena watershed as of uh, July 1st are no fishing for Chinook. Uh, for the, and then, um, what else? And oh, I also have a note here that the Kitsum Kalem River is actually completely no fishing from July 1st to August 31st. And so as of uh, August 15th, the entire Skeena watershed will go to no fishing for Chinook. Um, and uh, all of the other rivers and lakes that flow into kind of uh, the ocean, I guess, like from area, our areas one down to six, which is down into the uh, southern area are all no fishing for Chinook as well. Um, a few other things are happening. Uh, we sent some uh, correspondence out yesterday to our uh, uh, First Nations distribution list, and I don't know, we sent it to Charlie, but I don't know, perhaps we should add, add your names on there as well. Um, so because our, uh, it's still early in terms of the sockeye uh, returns to the Skeena, um, but the numbers are looking a little low right now. Um, in the past couple of years, we're not sure if that means anything because the fish have been coming late. Um, but uh, this week, uh, we will be closing the Skeena River to, uh, and, and the uh, marine area to uh, fish, recreational fishing for sockeye. Uh, so that will close this year, or this in the upcoming, uh, normally the trigger within our management plan would be uh, 800,000 uh, forecasted, I think. And um, we, we're not near that right now. So uh, we're, we're shutting down that. We're also in conversations with the province uh, because the water is so warm right now. Um, and so uh, looking at the water temperatures, they are quite high. Uh, at this, I believe uh, they told us that uh, up, like they're seeing temperatures like 18 up um, near <coughs> Kitwanga and stuff when that like late August temperatures in the water. And so that's a, a reason for concern. Um, and part of that concern is around the handling of fish if people are doing catch and release fishing later in the day. And so the province's drought management plan, as I understand it, and I, I may get this wrong, would call for um, looking at what it would look like to uh, only have sport fishing happening in the morning so that people could still go out and get food. Um, but you would avoid that time of the day when, they're, when the fish would be really stressed if they're being handled and put back. Um, so conversations are going on around that. Um, the forecast apparently is looking a little bit better um, which had people not as worried. I mean, we're seeing some pretty high temperatures for this time of year, um, but this, this week's a little bit better. So those are some conversations that are ongoing right now. Uh, every Wednesday um, in season, uh, we do have uh, a call. We have a lot of calls on Wednesdays in season. We have uh, basically calls with every harvesting group that, uh, that is out there. Um, Wednesdays at 1.15 is the uh, in-season uh, First Nations uh, call. And so uh, that is attended by First Nations from um, the Central Coast up to the North Coast and inland all the way to Lake Babine. And so uh, Charlie does attend those weekly and gets uh, information. And it's where they go through kind of like our weekly uh, catch information um, and what we're seeing in the fisheries and things like that. Uh, a weekly update does go out. So we'll make sure that uh, we get your names on the distribution list of that. Um, so, but that's kind of the high points. Around. There's our high points from that. Essentially, that you know, uh, yeah, we've got lovely weather, but it's causing high water temperatures. Sockeye numbers appear to be low right now. It's still really early. Like we wouldn't. Um, the way that it works is as the as the fish go through Taiyi, it goes into a formula and spits out a, um, an estimate of how many fish we're going to get. As we get closer to uh, sometime in July, I think it's the end of July. The 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 error on that gets smaller and smaller. Um, last year, we, we ran into the situation where we thought that there were it was pretty low, and then all of a sudden we had uh, we had a lot of fish. So um, we're keeping a close eye on it again and talking with everyone. So, so those are I don't know Anita, if you have anything to add to that. It's my I am not a technical person, so that is my my non technical <laughs> view of the world. So. <laughs> Can you can you explain again about Wednesday? So Wednesdays in season, all like all during the salmon season, is the time that 
our managers uh, have conversations with um, with the First Nations, with the rec sector, with the with the commercial sector, and it's not meant to be a um, like kind of sitting down and 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 the only time to talk because we do go out and have targeted individual meetings, but it's a time to give an update on what what we've seen over the last week and what kind of the planning is into the next week. And so on Tuesday afternoons, and I'll forward it out this week and make sure you guys get on the list, an update goes out that has a summary of all of the fisheries that have taken place uh, in the North Coast. It also has an update on uh, what we're seeing, of the information that we've gotten from Sangish and from uh, the Kitwanga Fence and, and, the Na and on the NAS, with all the fish wheels. And so that all goes into a summary that goes out. And then on Wednesdays, we kind of go through that summary and we hear back from uh, on the First Nations calling with the nations and on what they're seeing in their in their fisheries. And so one of the updates that we did get uh, over the last little bit from uh, from Charlie was that uh, what the rangers are seeing is that um, people are putting out kind of double the effort for this time of year and to get the same amount of Chinook that they would normally get. And so we're not sure what that means. Like, does that mean that they're holding up in the at the beginning of the trips because it's too hot like what what are what is happening so really invaluable information that we get on those those calls about what people are seeing out in, on the water and who could attend well it's you know i don't think it's meant to be restrictive um it's pretty open uh we get a range of people participating um we have the the first nations technical staff do come mm -hmm. um and then sometimes we'll have uh chief and council participate not as often um but occasionally they they pop in and listen in um, and uh, yeah, so I don't. I brought copies of the last two right for you. Oh, perfect. I think that'd be that'd be good to attend those, you know, because I mean, what are we doing? We're talking about fisheries, right? It'll be it'll be good to attend those. Yeah. And it's and it's how we coordinate it too, right? Like I mean, um, you know, we've talked before about you know um, the get some <coughs> watershed authorities and. What their area of expertise is and how that links into this group and and things like that and so making sure we make the best use of people's time too so. and uh the, do you guys ever talk about um jurisdiction no no, no. not on these this is okay. this is a hundred percent about what's going on with the like so dfo puts out a fishing plan every yeah. year so it's reporting out on what we're observing okay. as a result okay. of that. Besides, so not uh, jurisdiction uh, well you know that's that system yeah uh, question but yeah. um, the fish uh, is one of one of our major concerns and yeah. um, you know I, I for one would like to attend yeah. Yeah. you know get first-hand information yeah. Yeah. and yeah so that's the focus of those meetings is information out those those conversations about um, allocations and jurisdiction and stuff we usually reserve those for more bilateral conversations not with the whole with everybody at the tables I think that where where do you have the meeting? It's a phone call. We'll send it's, the info. Yeah, yeah we'll send the information. And you it's, mean you guys have uh, <coughs> meetings by phone? Yes, it's a it's a call in. It's oh, a call okay. in for information. Well, so I don't actually then. attend them. Um, I don't attend them very often. Uh, it's led by uh, Winita uh, chairs them, um, and then it's attended by our salmon managers. So like the people, our technical staff. So we don't even have to travel. No. We could just attend, and you know that would be considered a meeting. It's one hour on a Wednesday afternoon. I'll send the information um, and Tuesday night, you'll get the info packet that's going to be spoken to verbally in that one hour. Mm -hmm. um, usually try to leave lots of time for questions about the information. Um, it really varies who attends on a weekly basis, who is available. It's just a dial-in conference line and you're more than welcome to attend. And I've brought copies of the last two weeks of information and paper if you'd like to take it and read it later. Yeah. And we usually start, well, we kind of go back and forth. One week we might start up in area one and go down to area six and then <coughs> we might loop around and start in area six and go back up. We give a bit of an update on the Central Coast. The Central Coast nations don't usually call into these calls just because they've they're, they're different, like the fisheries on the central coast happen at a different time, so they usually work with the local managers down there. But uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a good information out opportunity and then to hear from other nations about what their food fishing is looking like. Just all that goes into, into management. Um, we were provided an update yeah. uh, from uh, Gitsam Watershed Authority. Yep. Uh, spoke a little bit, little bit about Sockeye and Chinook. Um, didn't paint a very bright picture of coming back this year. Um, they said like lowest since 1972 on the Thai test fishery for Chinook. 
which is so, pretty concerning. Yeah, we don't use the TIE as the TIE hasn't been tested to be a reliable in season indicator for Chinook. Um, however, there is a lot of interest in exploring what that could look like. So we've had some preliminary discussions with the Skeena Fish Commission about the work that their biologists have done to look at that. And um, I know that the nations have been watching it and seeing the trends and it's based on a short short time series. So it, it, it looks interesting. Um, and I think there's some commitment to uh, have a conversation in the fall about what it would look like to test that and see if it works. It, so the way um, most of our uh, assessment tools have been created is they've gone through a peer review science process to kind of let the scientists pick it apart because that's what they like to do. Um, and so they're gonna talk about what that could look like. So I know I know the nations are, are very uh, interested in that in that as a tool, but but right now the, the TIE has not been tested for that, for that purpose. Mm -hmm. Well, regardless, it sounds like numbers for both species are, are down. As they usual. are. They are. <clears throat> I'm just curious, like this call on Wednesday, um, you're talking about um, multiple calls that happen on Wednesdays. Mm -hmm. uh, is the commercial sector a part of those calls? And no. could you give oh, us sorry. a bit of a, an update on if there's like you guys have been working on um, regulation changes for inland fishing, sports fishing? Um, has regulations or timing of commercial fishing changed as a result of? Of what of the numbers? Um, so the way that it, um, in the Integrated Fisheries Management Plan, it lays out, for the Skeena anyway, really well, lays out uh, triggers and decision rules around commercial fishing. So in order for uh, a commercial sockeye fishery to occur, you, we would need to have a forecasted uh, return of 1.05 million. Um, so we're nowhere near that right now. So as of right now, we're not planning for the commercial <coughs> sockeye fisheries. Um, the way that, without getting into all of these books I don't have it all right in my head, um, the the timing of the various commercial fisheries are such that they, they look at the run timing of the different runs and try to schedule them so that they're not hitting those runs that might have um, some, some concerns. An example that I can give is uh, this the area F troll fishery um, for, for all of the species was delayed this year due to the Fraser concerns. Um, and so they wanted to make sure that the Fraser run, the majority of it had passed before they opened that commercial fishery. So, so it's based on run timing and things like that. As of right now, um, I don't think we've made any changes to the fishing plan. Um, no, I don't think we've made any changes. It's, it's based on the, on the preseason kind of plan that was in place. So. And the IFMP, I mean, we can, I think there's a link. It has not been, it's been drafted and it's in draft. It's sitting with the minister right now. So it hasn't actually been signed off on yet, but our practice is to proceed as, as planned. Um, when absence is I yep. noticed that um, your um, closure for Chinook is uh, August 15. Mm -hmm. um, when they come in May and then they go all the way, all the way uh, to well on summer basically, but uh, most of them come earlier. How come you don't close it then? Why don't you close it for the whole season? Right. This year we weren't anticipating, um, based on kind of the information that we had, that there would be an abundance issue for Chinook. We were, we were expecting an, an average year for Chinook in terms of abundance. The closures are to protect the spawning Chinook. So those later Chinook that come up so that they can, that they're, they're coming up to spawn. So make sure we have enough into the spawning channels. So that's why the trips are closed completely. Um, and then I, I believe the August 15th closure is so that those is to protect the spawning. Pretty sure it's always closed off. Yeah, I think that's been like years and yeah, years. Do you, do you guys have um, an agreement with the United States? There is a huge agreement with the United States. Um, because I'd like to find out because uh, I know that Alaska um, has, uh, you know, they've, uh, they've got 26 million salmon mm -hmm. already which uh, nearly 13, 13 million was sockeye. Mm -hmm. <laughs> nearly 100,000 were Chinook. That's a lot. Mm -hmm. and, and they're doing it uh, um, where our fish come from. They, uh, you know, that's, that's their route. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're just, uh, well, they're decimating our, uh, our fish, uh, fish stocks. 
I mean, uh, if you guys have a, a, an agreement with the United States, then I think you guys should uh, uh, bring that up to them. Yeah, so I'm not I'm not involved in the Pacific Salmon Treaty negotiations, but it is a huge a huge negotiation process. I believe they just finished the chapter on Chinook in the last little while. But uh, yeah, rest assured, those are those are conversations that go on about how many fish and and things like that. It's a it's a it's it's a tree, it's a full time job, I think almost. Yeah, because um, you know we're talking about you know small little numbers coming up mm -hmm. here, and they're talking in the millions that they're catching, and there are fish. Yeah. That agreement's been there for a decade. Yeah, it's a long term. Agreement. American still needs to They just do what they want. They said they share water, even though they have agreement in Canada and the U.S. They do a state breach. I heard about this years ago. Mm -hmm. Same with down south. Sometimes they come up north to fish up the Canadian waters. Mm -hmm. Just before the Chinook started coming up in China, I heard there's abundance of Chinook at the saltwater coast. And all of a sudden they said there's hardly any. So who's right? Well, you know, it's uh, it's tricky. I mean, the, the fish, um, you know, you know, Chaz, you were mentioning that the numbers all look low at this point in time. Um, oh, I just mean in general, in yeah, the last 50 years, yeah. every year it's declining, right? Yeah, and, and the other thing that's happening is they're coming later. So they seemed over the last couple of years, it yeah. seems like the fish have been later. Because of the water temperature. Yeah, and so that's been some of the questions we've been talking about, like, because we are hearing anecdotally that in the marine, uh, fishermen are doing great that they're seeing tons of Chinook and so then the question becomes is the water temperature in the river an issue are they swimming lower are they not getting caught in the net is that what's going on like is it changing the fish behavior um, and so I think that that's where you know more science is always like useful and, and also looking at um, you know changing fishing habits whether it's individual fishing habits or even the way we run our test fishery to figure out you know what are the fish doing yeah, science has been proven wrong so many times. Yeah. Yeah. Hard to believe, but it needs true. to constantly be changing. Yeah. Yeah, adapting. There's no fish and all of a sudden you get millions coming up. Yeah. And then they've opened the coast and there's no fish, so yeah. Yeah. That's why it's how so did they find out scientifically besides Tahi? <clears throat> and you just said they don't use Tahi for the chinook? Not fishing. Yeah, it shows on there. Yeah, the nation, yeah, the, the, especially the, the Skeen and Fish Commission nations are very interested in, uh, in, in, in exploring if that is a, is a viable tool. And I think we would all want there to be in-season indicators for all of the fish if we could have it, because it makes, makes life a little easier, right? Because mm -hmm. then, then there's less risk. So. But this is why, you know, these conversations are so important that we have throughout the season, because management isn't simply just what science says and just simply like that's not the only thing that gets looked at um you know observations are so important seeing what's happening in the alaskan fisheries and we do talk about that on wednesdays and you'll see that in the updates uh what's being seen in the alaskan fisheries what's being seen further south um you know what the ocean conditions are looking like and it, it all kind of factors in there yeah but each time you ask a question there's always been proven scientifically so what do we do? Just go along with them, believe what they're saying? Or? The natives have been fishing for centuries. They know what's up. And this climate change they're talking about, that, that affects everything. Mm -hmm. Wildlife, look at the animals, they're smaller and smaller every year. And that affects the fish the same way. Warmer temperature, they go deeper according to what I heard. I used to fish with my uncles at the coast and, until the saline came into the mouth. Then I knew that we're in trouble there. And another thing I want to ask is how, how does uh, some of the natives get to commercial fish up to Skeena? It's just one one group. So which, which fishery? Down river. Oh, in the river? No, it can't. 
live catch. You're talking about the live catch at Kittwood Bar? Yeah. yeah. They, use, they use nets and they sell the fish commercially. So that's commercial fishing. The only um, commercial fishery, commercial stuff fishery that I'm aware of would be um, we do have uh, under the commercial salmon allocation framework, which is a, a process that involves um, transferring shares from the commercial fishery to uh, people who put forward proposals. There was a proposal uh, put forward by the uh, North Coast Kenya First Nation Stewardship Society to do, um, it's a bit of a mosquito food, I think. Is it mosquito food? No. It's a, it's a small scale fishery that happens, that is proposed to happen in areas 412 and 415, so at the mouth of the Spina. Um, however, it, it can only happen if a commercial fishery, if an all, like the regular commercial fishery happens, because it's a share of the catch of that fishery. Right now, there are no, no commercial fisheries in area four, um, so that that fishery would not go ahead. So it was through that, that process. The Gitsan also have uh, a, a CSAP demo fishery, um, I believe. Do you know? I always felt like there was one third, one third, one third. Like one third Simshan, one third Gitsan, and one third Lake Babine of the shares. I can find out the exact information and share yeah, it with you guys. I'm talking about the Skeena. Yeah, no, this was on the Skeena. On the river, that's where the one group of commercial fishing had to fix up. Yeah. So how can the government allow one group to commercial fish on the Charlie Henry fish? Yeah, those, those are the only things I'm aware of. Otherwise, there's no other commercial fish. I know that people don't like here in this group. How does the government know there's too much fish? Who was there to count them 1,000 years ago? The fish find their own way of spawning ground. So he can't say there's too much fish going up. And, and then the uh, same fish at Lake Babine, after all this time, the fish fight their way up and then they get caught. So commercially to, uh, so the government was actually catering to the rich people. That's how it is, money. Yeah. Never mind the Gitsan the natives. That's their staple food for centuries. I know I'm going off line here, but that's what they've done with the buffalo. They killed all the buffalo, and now they're trying to do the same with fish for, for the sake of the mighty dollar. You guys got to start thinking to be on board with us. With, what are we going to fight for if there's no fish anymore? Look at the caught fish in Newfoundland. It hasn't recovered. Government's fault. We don't want the same thing to happen here. So everybody has to be on board, Coretto, BC, all the other nations. <coughs> Thank you. You know, further to what Bob is saying, um, I, on on uh, on the ski now, there's hardly any hunks anymore. Mm. Uh, they're catching them all up at Pabim, and they're they're using uh, they're using the bay uh, the roe for um, they export it to China or Japan or something like that for uh, caviar. And um, <clears throat> you know, our people do eat uh, eat that the hunks. It's a delicacy, so um, we're not getting any. Very few, very few. Yeah. So that that is a good point. See, Morristown hardly got any fish last year too. Guys, um, yeah, I just want to circle back to. Um, Amy's original comments just around the regulation changes and um, you know from my perspective it sounds like um, there's been some changes that I've never seen happen in the past so to me that's a sign of some good um, 
how effective it is is yet to be seen, but um, specifically that the closure and the tributaries and the section from Hell's Gate down to the Zim Accord. Um, I grew up in Terrace and uh, every year uh, from mid-July to mid-August, there's upwards of 50 to 80 people uh, camped along that section of river. Uh, people are using methods that are so effective that you know they can catch a fish on almost every every uh, pass if they want using back bouncing and back trolling and all these different methods if you have enough money in a boat and you know how to do that and have enough fish roll you can go and catch as many fish as you want in a day a lot of the time from from what I've seen is people are targeting females for the eggs so they can keep on fishing um, so I've watched this for years and years. I was on uh, the Skeena when Kiss and Kalen tried to close that section of the river to do their food fishing and, and seeing that go down. So I just want to say that I think that's a positive move and I, I personally was really glad to see that. Yeah, we were happy this year that uh, we were able to reach agreement with Collins on the piece. Yeah, it was really helpful. So that was a collaboration with the province? Yeah, so the way that it works is that, you know, DFO is the regulatory authority for salmon. Mm -hmm. So when we close the river, we have it in our, our ability to vary, and I always use the wrong terms, but to do put the regulations forth that would close it to fishing for salmon. However, we aren't able to put the stuff forward to stop the no fishing for steelhead, steelhead or for um, trout, because other trout, because that's been delegated to the province. So. Um, you know, we raised that last year as someone could be out catching and release fishing for Chinook and say, oh, I'm fishing for steelhead. Mm -hmm. I mean, most people aren't going to do that, but you will get the odd one. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's good to have the mirror order in place in those trips because I think we'll, see, we'll secure that protection. What's, was Kitts and Calum a driver in that as well? or? Um, Kitts and Calum actually, you know, over the last few years, they've been pretty progressive in their conversations with the recreational sector. Um, and uh, and meeting with them to talk about those different time and area closures, um, we have we have had lots of conversations with them about that. So the rule fishing <laughs> is that uh, <laughs> the rule fishing uh, when you catch the female, you take the rule. Pull the female fish back in the I've seen. I've I'm seen. Not sure. I'm not familiar with the. I've practice. seen where they they'll target people on the ri river banks. Okay. And they'll bring their boats to shore and say, "Oh, hey, I got this fish. We're limited out. Do you want it?" And then they'll hand the rod over, and as they had the rod over, because they know it's a female, they, they let all the males go, right? And the and oh, uh, I'll just take the roll from that. So I've seen that oh, happen personally. Yeah. And I've had friends that are fishing guys watch people. Um, catch them, bring them to the side of the or see that it's a female, right? And then pretend it's really big and pull their anchor and go downstream where nobody can see them, and then slit them open and take the eggs and sink the carcass. Interesting. It's almost twenty dollars for a little thing of pinker, um, pinker sockeye rope in Terrace, right? So um, just to show you how valuable a female chinook is, one of the big scheme like that is like you know sixty, eighty bucks if you were to buy it at a store so people want to fish and that's the most effective way to fish so they're targeting the females right totally interesting ignorant. i've never interesting i've watched it for years yeah, and i no, spot I specifically you. on croak bar <coughs> hog yeah. line and all those holes that are down there chicken bar yeah every single year it's just like how is this keep on like it's it's pretty crazy it's wild interesting the other point the health the health of the fish when you're cleaning your scaps, or, or not scaps, but uh, lesions. obviously, what? Lesions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sores and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so some people, like my brothers and sisters, they uh, they just cut that part off the fish, throw it, throw it away. Yeah. But, uh, some people throw the whole fish away. So is that the health of the fish, is that taken into consideration for closing and opening? So that is one of the things that we're talking about right now with the water temperatures is, um, you know, health of the fish and how it's affecting them. People are noticing, I don't know if you guys have noticed, 
but the fish are really dark already. Um, like the Chinook are really dark and they're pooling in these cooler waters. So, um, well, no one's yeah. catching them up here, but I've seen chromers down below. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, so yeah, health of fish is something that is considered. It's, it's partly what, what factors in. This is a lot of this is new to us up here, right? Because we don't have had the temperatures that everybody else has had. Because you're going to see a lot of those parasites and things like that do better in warmer water. Mm -hmm. um, and when fish are all kind of congregating <laughs> together, right? So I agree, though. You just cut it off. Like, you really do better bad. education on that. Yeah. The yeah, are really bad. Really? Uh, there's a biologist at the fish camp, the Anact, and uh, she she told the fishermen to burn all the to burn all the pinks that have that because when the animals feed on them, it spread and causes a cycle. Interesting. So we're wondering if that goes through the DFO. I I have never heard that, but that yeah. doesn't mean that our I, I'll check with our pink. We have a pink <coughs> so I'll check with her and ask her. Yeah. You know, uh, another thing about um, the, the animals eating the fish, uh, it's it's the um, humps that they're always after. They go up the creeks, and you know it's easy for them to catch because mm -hmm. you know they're going up the creeks in shallow. Mm -hmm. And the bears, um, they're all starving in the wilderness mm -hmm. because there's no uh, no food, and they're coming into into villages, you know, on the reserves. Um, and our people um, eat, eat, eat bears, and um, they're they're finding that there's uh, less and less bears each year. Um, last year there's hardly any, but this year uh, there's uh, there's a little bit more, you know. And um, you know that's uh, that's taken away from our people too. Uh, in that way, not only is there less fish each year. But there's less uh, less uh, game, including bear. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's affecting everybody. And and if if you think about what Gordon just said, there's so much cancer in uh, amongst our people. Cancer. And uh, when you think of us getting cancer, um, that's. Um, something to worry about, but then our dogs, they're getting cancer too. So, I don't know, it's like that with the white people. Um, we were just talking about that on the way here. Yeah. <laughs> Lost too many friends lately. Yeah, I mean, I'm talking about dogs, you know. Oh, not dogs, oh yeah. yeah. Because I've noticed that there's quite a few dogs uh, mm. that have died of cancer in this area. Talking about cancer, I tried to get the information. See if the government can uh, test some of the fish. It was brought up quite a few times, but nothing. What's in the fish that's causing cancer? Chemicals. And I'm trying to get a hold of what kind of chemicals that CN is using to spray it right away. And even the forestry, I don't know if they still do it. And they're replanting. They spray chemicals. And animals eat it. We eat animals. And the cycle goes round and round. Those things we have to look at, not just on the river, but, but everything goes on the river. We eat fish every year. Sometimes the people catch steelhead in winter. So it doesn't stop. Steelhead is a year-round fish. It doesn't come seasonally like the others. We talked about fish on last time you said that. So if there's any way the government can test some of the fish. Yeah, and so I have two things. I remember uh, Patty did forward out um, some documents related to the CN spraying um, back on uh, April, in April, from our meeting, that meeting. So I think he sent it. Oh, you guys should have it. How many, how many pages? There. It, um, it was the letter to the Gitsan Hereditary Chiefs on July 11th, 2018. And it's uh, like four pages. And then, then there was the actual management plan, I think, which probably looks a little bit longer. It's like 
38 pages. That's the actual pest management plan that goes into what they're actually using. So I think uh, you should have it in your email on April 17th. Pest management plan? Pest management plan, yeah. That she ends? Yes, yes. Yeah, so I mean, I'm not gonna give him total kudos because he's not here, but he did yeah. he did follow through on that action item. <laughs> yeah. Um, with respect to, uh, you know, testing the fish and things like that. Um, yeah, his question was cancer. Yeah, specifically for cancer. So. Who's addressed cancer? They might say what chemicals are being used though, which would then maybe, I don't know, yeah, good point. Probably all chemicals. Yeah, I think cancer. so too, I agree. This is probably maybe, causing cancer, know. this is probably causing cancer. Well, yeah. You so know, the, the muffin, ocean. Not the muffin, it was good. The ocean <laughs> is a cesspool of um, everything that comes from uh, humankind. Yeah. And um, right now there's a leak, I think it's in Japan, is it? Right? Uh, um, oh, a nuclear reaction. Nuclear reaction. There's a leak there, it's been leaking into the ocean, and it, uh, people are noticing that there's a lot of um, deformities in, in some, a lot of the sockeye that are coming up. And um, if you talk about cancer, you know, that's one, one place where cancer would be. It, it comes from the ocean, not only from the ocean, but it comes from all the spraying that uh, CN does. Mm -hmm. you know. And the forestry. Yeah, yeah, and the forestry. Oh my God. They, they, they spray tons and tons of uh, things in the forest. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the animals, they eat this. Yeah. I wonder, I wonder if Health Canada would have, because, you know, I, I, we, okay. we joke that every time there's a fish, people it says fish at the front, people go, it must be DFO. But I'm just wondering if Health Canada would have programs related to that as well. Yeah. I would think so. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm wondering if uh, the government has information that the First Nations are not getting. And, and one indication is the recreational fishermen get the female fish and they take the roll, yeah. dump the carcass just for fun. They're having fun. They're not going to eat it anyway, but yeah. they like, they enjoy the fishing part. Yeah. So there's that little cycle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I've written that down to check so, in. So that's sort of a serious question about uh, uh, the disease in the fish and yeah. the various effects of CN, nuclear. And I remember seeing, I was just looking through my email because I remember seeing a similar question related to the NAS earlier um, this week or last week and, and finding out that the Nishka had done some fish health <coughs> Um, studies on the NAS. Mm -hmm. um, so I've just written that down. I'm going to look to see what was involved to get that off the ground and see if there's any sim things similar going on on the scene. I don't know that there is, um, but that doesn't mean there isn't. <laughs> there could be. If there any one of the health should have. Yeah, yeah. So we'll do a little bit of digging and see what we can find out. Yeah. Is DFO responsible for managing whales? Yes. <laughs> we are involved. I mean, that, I, we don't manage whales. We manage people well, <laughs> and, yeah, and the interactions with whales. But yes. you may have seen some stuff on the southern resident killer whales as of late. Um, well, and gray whales. Yeah, the gray whales, gray whales coming whales. up. Yeah, yeah. Supposedly down the whole coast of the U.S., there's tons of mortalities that they're finding. Um, their biologists are saying they're mostly starving to death, mm. uh, malnourished. Which is, it's like keystone species, yeah. right? When you think about the food web, like. When things start collapsing at the top, what's going to happen down below? And there's a reason why they're dying, right? And part of it's fishing, there's nets caught on them and that kind of stuff. But mm -hmm. the starvation piece is really, really scary. Mm -hmm. Garbage. Yeah. yeah uh, see, what I'm getting, what I'm, the point I'm getting to on the, the health of the fish mm -hmm. is that uh, we, we, Kicks and have always wanted access to the fish. Mm -hmm. And if the government knows that there's health problems with the fish and not informing the Kicks and, because they do have a lot of uh, information, DFO, uh, provincial, and uh, the government uh, in the past have uh, did a lot of medical testing on Aboriginal people. At Miller Bay, 
and various uh, vaccines. And so if what I'm getting at is if we're being used as a huge test for the fishery, <coughs> given that the recreational fishermen just throw the fish back in again and not eat it, we eat it. So I'm wondering if the government is keeping an eye on us to see if we survive. That seems far-fetched, but when you look at the health and, and the cancer concerns and, and, and that, so if there's any information that you folks have become aware of, we'd like to have that too. Because we don't really get a lot of information from the government. No. You know, uh, what Gordon said is that <coughs> it's not the first time that um, the government used us as guinea pigs. You know, in the residential the schools, they used us as guinea pigs. And um, you mentioned Miller Bay. Um, there was one story about um, how we were used as guinea pigs to see if we, uh, how far we last if they, you know, starve us, starve us to death. And there was a hospital in um, Nanaimo. They used the same, the same thing. They used the First Nations as guinea pigs, and and there was a big graveyard of uh, First Nations. It's a, it was a residential school. So it's not far fetched. Um, that's that was just a few years ago, if you think of it. I mean, some of us are still survivors. I'm a survivor of an Indian residential school. So um, what we're bringing up here is very important for the health of our people. And, and that includes the fracking, uh, of which, you know, the white man, are, are, they're saying it's, the, it's clean energy. Well, it's not. When they frack, all that uh, gas is released, and it's not really, they don't catch it all. It co it's released into the air, and it comes down as acid rain onto large, huge tracts of land. And, uh, and our animals eat this, and we eat the animals. It goes into the water, so uh, we eat the fish. So there's another point of um, <coughs> contamination there, you know. So it's, it's everything, everything all adds up. So we've convicted the government. <laughs> On every aspect. <laughs> we were talking about it this morning. We were talking about genetically modified food and, oh you know, God, fish yeah. that can eat faster than every other fish and <laughs> ocean ranching and then we were like well at some point we're going to run out of food so we have to do like talk about conspiracy <laughs> theories right like what, what if we run out of food we have to eat something yeah no i get it <laughs> you want to trust your food right if you can't trust your food and water well, uh, what else have you got right <laughs> like i get it we've got um, we've got some connections uh, from my old life in yes. nanaimo I, I work only on shellfish so clams and oysters and crab and uh, some pretty good connections with the first nations health authority so We'll dig around and see what we can find with regard to fish health that relevance to the North Coast and can share. Well, I bet you there's a lot of uh, hidden hidden documents, you know. Uh, Robert, uh, and then we'll take a 10 minute break. Yeah, Chad brought up wheels. <laughs> shields. Do they come up to There's getting too many shields on the ocean. When I was fishing with my uncles when I was a teenager, we used to, we were allowed to shoot them. And all of a sudden the government stopped that. And the only natural enemy the seals have is the whales. But you hardly see whales inside the coastline towards the ski. There used to be a bounty on them, $5 cut off the nose, because uh, I don't know if the Kitsan ever eat seals. I know the coast natives do. Mm -hmm. And that's another problem, overabundance of seals. They just scorch out mm -hmm. some of the fish. Mm -hmm. That's it, even when you're fishing. That's why we were shooting them. They wreck so many fish on your net, 
and there's now, there's just too many, which could be the cause of decline in some of the fish species. So we're asking what the government's going to do about that. Is it put back the bounty on them, or? I know it sounds cruel, but we have to eat too. Yeah. Like even the government is culling wolves. I don't agree with that, but my boss told me to stop. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking with you. <laughs> Start my. Oh, so they're uh, up again. No, my. Okay, fine. Okay, well, let's okay. take a, a 10 minute break. <laughs> <laughs>
2020 season uncertain. So we have um, uh, four uh, speakers that, that would like to um, shed some light on the next um, four and five and uh, show maybe a vacation with us. Sure, I always am. Uh, so we'll start with Robin and then um, uh, Robert and Chaz and then um, Art. My uh, topic is uh, no access to enough fish site, fish rule. There is no access to our enough for non first nation or non local members. There is no trespass. It is our ancient law which sets the standard of no trespass. It is a living standard for all first nations. This is our ways for thousands of years. It is our adopt. And we follow our adopt like the Ten Commandments. We get our adopt from our true events or our interpretation of an event that happened to us thousands of years ago. It's our connection to our Lakyip and our Anat. Our adopt is our origin of how we came to be and how we came to own our Anat and our Lakyip. stories, uh, some of them are stories of uh, origin, so that's what the Robin was saying, a devil. I'm just uh, explaining what the yeah. devil was saying. Yes, come on in. Shemi Rigat Shema. We're talking about permits and license issued by the government. We don't recognize those license and permits on the kids and their six. And at we're talking about the skina. The whole Ali Aks, which is the skina. There's no gap in between that and that. We're talking about the whole river. And the government issuing license and permits does not authorize trespass by any sport fishing or any non-native. Even as natives ourselves, we not cannot trespass on these others and not jurisdiction. You have to ask for permission. And if you don't do that, there's a consequences. Actually, the Kitchen and the natives are the first ones to have three strikes and you're out before the European law came up with that. It is more stronger than the European law, our laws. 
Nobody can change it. The chiefs can't change it. People cannot change it. Government cannot change it. It's practically written in stone. They call it Wachlez. Wachlez. It's continuous. Just like the name. When I'm gone, there'll be another Niskiminu. Down, up, down, up. Never stop. Just like the territory. First contact with the Europeans is when things started to change. <clears throat> so the government is enabling the other people to trespass on our territory, our jurisdiction. We cannot accept that. The Gitsan has been using the river for fish for thousands, thousands of years. And they know how to manage. Take what you need and leave the rest. <clears throat> so as that goes as our Gitsan government. We don't not recognize permit and license issued by any government, feds or BC, period. We have more title rights than feds and BC government. And that's where we stand right now. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. <clears throat> Based on what we're seeing out there, um, it seems to be respected um, by the recreational fishers. There's definitely a decrease um, in the amount of fishermen we're seeing on the river these days. Um, the sockeye haven't come full swing, so we'll really see when the, the steelhead and the, the sockeye make their way in. Um, but you know, hearing all of the information coming from the Taiyi and from the Gitsan Watershed Authority. You know, our Simbiget did not need to know all of that data to know that the river needs to be shut down because our fisheries are depleting. Um, so I think that's a good validation that we're on the right track. Um, you know, now we're looking to 2020 and um, things aren't looking good for it to be open in 2020. Like we're making small progresses on some regulations regulation changes and whatnot, but um, we really want to see an increase in the number of fish coming into the Skeena, so um, that that conversation uh, is still ongoing. Yep, that's it, thank you. Thank you, Chaz. Outset, we had uh, brought out uh, the idea of a tribunal to begin to fix the problems that we're talking about, and, um, and we've created a back and forth uh, jurisdiction with the feds and the provinces, and, um, and and I think all of us agree that there is a problem that. Um, only coming from us that uh, we, we have watched this historical decline and, uh, and and I think a lot of people w would not argue with that historical decline and, uh, and and I think some some of the the happenings worldwide I think uh, when it, when it comes to the United Nations declaration um, I heard uh, Premier Horgan's um, talk with the with Odin when they met with him. Uh, I, I seen a live feed on uh, on uh, Facebook, and, uh, and he was talking about um, 
implementing uh, the United Nations, not the United Nations Declaration, I know. And and I think you've heard about our historical practices here and uh, some of our management ideas, of all of the signs that we see, and um, and I think you you hear that. A lot of the targets of um, four fish are seals, uh, animals. There's, there's a lot of other targets that that we we don't really talk about too much, and but yet they affect the population of fish. And um, so with this juice with this tribunal, I think our jurisdictions will meet where, um, and it would be for the good of the salmon. And, um, like, um, when I don't see the problems here, then uh, I, I really wonder, uh, I just keep my wondering to myself, I guess. And, <coughs> So I think we were trying to be serious about the fix part of this, and uh, that's why we threw out the idea of the tribunal. So, so where all the jurisdictions will meet, and uh, and and I think the one of the pushes that we try to make was to meet with, uh, with Minister Doug Donaldson and um, hoping that he would push forth somebody to sit at the table. And, um, and we thought he did that, but uh, I, I don't know if my thoughts are correct, but um, um, so I think at some point uh, from the province and the feds, uh, I think we need to hear more. Uh, like, do you agree that you, we, we ought to fix this thing or, or what? But, uh, and I think we do. Yeah. Thanks. <coughs> Thank you, Hart. Comments? I know you're dying, yeah. Spit it out. <laughs> um, before I before I um, respond, I just wanted to check. I had heard from Patty that there is a meeting scheduled with the province on Thursday with you guys. You just heard that? Well, no, I, I heard it yesterday. We did have one, but uh, Tom McCarthy said they weren't ready. Okay, let me just pull up the email. Let me double check. So I'm a little. In Vancouver. That got postponed. It got postponed. Oh, okay. Our meeting with um, Tom McCarthy, the um, BC Treaty Negotiator. Yeah, if that's what he's referring to. There's more. There's more. Oh, but the signage. About some special signage that the province was yeah. helping with? Yeah. Putting up? Yeah. That's been deferred. He mentioned it, and they were going to develop their proposal a little, a little better, I suppose. But I'm just trying to find. I don't remember if he told me verbally or if it's in my emails from you. It's from you. Yeah, I don't want to say they're committed to, to the signage, but that's what Tom proposed. Yeah, it sounds like there's. Okay, so I just wanted to check on that. Okay. So there's no meeting. Oh. Well, I'm not sure. You can tell, you can tell Patty that Tom is chairing the meeting. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, that's helpful. So we're trying to find our our way of working with the province too, because I mean, you guys probably know I don't get to tell the province what to do, and <laughs> unfortunately, um, and they don't get to tell me what to do. Who do I get to tell what to do? Me. <laughs> I 
tell the guys and things. Nobody, nobody listens to me, Jordan. <laughs> I could, at some point, I know we've had a lot of talk about um, uh, being not and stuff like that, but if people are interested, I could explain how the North Coast part of DFO works and how we kind of feed into the regional programs. It's it's convoluted. It's like this and like this and like this, but um, I, I can do that at some point if people are interested. Um, maybe you can understand it and figure it out and tell me if I tell you all the pieces because it's very confusing. Um, thank you, Robin, Robert, Norman, and Art, for your words. I always really enjoy hearing about the Anat and Adawak. Is that am I from Adawak? Adawak. Okay, Adawak. I'm going to do it horribly, but you'll know what I mean. Adawak. Adawak. And is that the word that's spelt? With the no, A, no, a it's a different Ayuk. I thought yeah. so. So now, so what's the difference between the Ayuk and the? Ayuk was <coughs> law. Okay. And the Dao is the history of our people. Okay. Each 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 house has a history. Okay. Thank you. Guys, you learn how to use your tongue when you. Speak. I know. <laughs> you know, I I took French at school, and they used to make us do all these weird like mouth movements before we could even speak French because French, same thing. There's lots of rolling and and stuff like that, and I feel like maybe mm -hmm. our English words are so like. <laughs> in, in our language, there's a lot of guttural, uh, guttural sounds, uh, yeah. a lot of stops, and mm -hmm. uh, they said that uh, our language is one of the hardest to learn in the world. Oh, wow. Yeah. I grew up in North Wales, a lot of double L's, and that's <laughs> the same sound, yeah, sound. <laughs> very few vowels. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you. Um, you know, we've talked about over our, our last uh, meetings about uh, the jurisdiction and the access and the and the statement that's been put forth by the by the Gitsan government. And um, I know that you know at this time, uh, you know both DFO and the province have stated that you know we will continue to issue permits right now because when there's a conservation <coughs> issue that we we do stop issuing the permits, but. As we work through this, that's that's kind of how things are falling out. Um, whether you call it a tribunal or a or a table, like a, a solutions table or what or whatever you call it, I think that um, you know we as DFO are interested in that. Um, the way that we get to that, uh, there's different ways to do it. Um, if it if it's about um, you know, decision making and things like that, that's a little bit more complicated for us right now, given the legislation that we have and that we have to work with in us as the federal government. Um, many of the uh, tables that I'm involved in, whether it be with the Haida or with, um, you know, the, the Central Coast uh, or various nations that we work with, we have come together to create tables. Sometimes they're trilateral with the province, sometimes they're just bilateral with the nations. Uh, to develop a forum where we do come up with management actions as recommendations back to our respective authorities. Um, and that seems to be something that we've been able to do without, uh, you know, putting our, our minister in a compromising situation. Um, so I do think that there is interest in, in exploring, in exploring what that could look like. Um, I really uh, think that it is something that we would want to involve the recreational harvesters in because you know we've talked about how uh, if there any any law or any um, regulation or best practices is only as good as the buy-in that you get from the people who are out there you can have all the enforcement in the in the world and unless they're there at every second of every day it, it's good to get the buy-in so um, I think if at some time and I'm, I'm so glad that we're going to, to meet with them uh, how we engage them is, is going to be an important piece so the buy-in of the fishermen? The buy-in of the people that you are that you want to influence, I think, right? So, um, and, and and sometimes that's not, you know, we were talking about this today about how in any anything that, any interaction that we as government have with people, and I'm, I'm sure you find this, that uh, if you don't have that kind of opportunity <clears throat> for people to be heard and and whatnot, they're less likely to to follow along with things. 
people won't necessarily agree with decisions that get made, but if they feel heard and like they, they understand the decision better, it, it just, we avoid those kind of end runs and, and things that happen. So, so that's what I mean by buy-in. It's not necessarily their veto or they're okay, but that we're working together to come up with a, con like a solution that people will support. Touching on the tribunals gives them an opportunity to be heard. Yeah, no, definitely. And, I, and that's why I'm saying, if you call it a tribunal or an advisory board or whatever you call it, right, it doesn't, it's more the principles behind it. And so I'd be really interested to start fleshing out what those principles are and, and things like that. And, you know, I'm sure you have ideas about those principles. We've got a ton of examples of places where we're starting to do this, um, where we are working, uh, you know, we've had a lot of conversations about government to government conversations with nations and with some nations now that's expanding into where we're engaging stakeholders together, which is, is, is good. Yeah, if you look at DFO now, they're sort of like a tribunal. You make the decisions of what's fair and not fair. So with the idea of the wreck fishermen slicing open the female Chinook and taking the eggs, and then dumping the fish in the river. That's that's a huge amount of wastage. Just for for the eggs, whether they use it or they're if they're harvesting and selling it at twenty dollars a cup a cupful, then that's you know, that's not fair. So a tribunal would look at a, at a at that type of situation. So when the gigs and say there is no trespassing on the enact to our recreational fishermen. The tribunal will review that and determine, is it fair mm -hmm. to stop the wreck fishermen from accessing the enact? And then if the wreck fishermen is wasting the fish, the tribunal will say definitely, yeah, it's fair. You shouldn't access the enact because mm -hmm. you're only going to waste the fish. For, for pure fun. And then on the other hand, if the wreck fisherman is a genuine fisherman for food, what he's doing, then the fairness then would come out in his favor. So that's a type of uh, effort we see the tribunal will be doing, not an advisory board. Right. Because if it's an advisory board, it leaves uh, the fairness determination to DFO, which is highly influenced by the fishing industry, mm -hmm. the wreck fish industry, the commercial fishing industry, people that are selling hooks. So we, we don't feel that DFO is a very good uh, tribunal in that sense. Mm -hmm. Uh, also, um, but just before you start, uh, Norman, uh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Art had his hand up. Yeah, he had his hand up. Okay. Um, my thoughts are for the tribunal, um, like with we're, we're thinking uh, the province jurisdiction, the federal jurisdiction, and our jurisdiction, and, uh, and I think it would be fair to bring. The uh, sport fishermen in to, to hear their mm -hmm. thoughts about this whole gamut of what we're talking about and, uh, and and I think because they're out there we can't ignore them so um, but I think uh, for for the practices that that, that they're showing us um, that that could be a part of the tribunal's um, agenda. Uh, like, um, like in fairness, we hear from them, and uh, and then if those practices are detrimental, then the tribunal can agree it is detrimental. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can all agree to make some changes. And, Yeah, 
have more say than us, there's something wrong with that. And, and, but, but to be fair, to be fair, we need to hear from them. Thank you, Art. Yeah, thanks. Norman? Yes, okay. Um, uh, okay, uh, tribunal, uh, the tribunal is um, very important because um, uh, we have to look at uh, things from uh, the perspective of the Gitsan. Um, and that means incorporating um, decisions from the court, uh, what the court thinks, thinks about um, our way of life. And uh, one of the things that um, the courts say is that we they have to take uh, into consideration perspective, pers perspectives from First Nations. And um, if you incorporate uh, Andre into that, then you cannot take the lives of uh, First Nations and to get some. And you can't chip away at it because that is going to be paramount to um, genocide. Everything that you guys are doing is paramount to genocide because our people are dying out because of this the mismanagement of the government and the DFO in turn. So um, when you when you think about this, it is it is just a tremendous. Uh, it's a big, huge thing that our people are dealing with, the death of our people and their culture. Um, and the tribunal will be there to enforce this, enforce our, our way of life. We cannot have just uh, the white man's way of life. And we cannot be following the white man's way of life because look at what happens is happening to us. We're dying now. It's genocide. Regardless of how you look at it. Um. Thank you, Norman. Amy. Um, I just I had a question for the table. I'm just thinking about this a little bit. Um, and you know we've talked about because uh, I think it's similar to a tribunal, but um, the the uh, body that was created on the Fraser to help with the the issues that happened down there with uh, between harvesters and we talked about it a lot, but I'm wondering if with our meeting with the rec sector, if there would be interest, if I can find someone from that process and bring them up to talk to us and kind of explain what happened, what, how it worked, what didn't, and also afford the opportunity if you guys want to talk to that person by yourselves, I don't need to be there. Um, DFO doesn't need to be there, but maybe just to explore it a bit and see how they got to where they did. Um, we might, there might be some really great lessons learned from that, that so we, um, you know, like learn some stuff about what worked, how they did it. Um, yeah, that might be there. Might be value in that. I know. I know. I had mentioned Ernie Cray before, and uh, he was off because he had had a stroke. I understand he's he is getting better, but uh, I can check in with Dave Barrett. Uh, he was heavily involved in that process, and David Moore, and see if um, someone could perhaps come and speak to David? about it. If that's a thing, David Moore, I think his name was. Could be totally getting that wrong again. Making up names. It's been a long week. Um, Related to Norman? Uh, must be. <laughs> must be. <laughs> My mother's last name is Smith, so I'm related to everybody. <laughs> um, we are all cousins. Um, but uh, you know, I'm just thinking, like, as we kind of sure. work through this, like, we're talking about working sessions, and that's really what it is. I mean, we're all learning and trying to figure out what to do here. So I can I can explore that, and then. If we do it at the same time, it's a time for everyone to learn from each other. Just a just a suggestion to the table. Works. Yeah, well, 
made all the information you can get regarding this fest. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter where you're from. <laughs> and don't forget that you're dealing with hereditary system here. What you guys been dealing with is the band officers. We're different. We had our law set before contact, and it's still there. It has not been abolished. And by your IOC, you cannot change it. And your guys' highest court agreed with our adult oral history. Yet the government is breaking that all the time. And nobody say nothing to the government through the legislation. When you guys want to change something, you use legislation. We don't do that. It's set. So I have to remind you that you are dealing with a hereditary system. It's on territory. A bit. Are you done with uh, your comments uh, on what's being forward? Yeah, no, and uh, the only other thing I was going to um, mention about, you know, we talk about all of the different factors that go into decision making and trying to balance all of those. And I, you know, that that is something that, that we as DFO try to do. I mean, we have the doctrine of priority, conservation first, then First Nations, food, social, ceremonial access, and then where there's space based on our various different policies, access for other Canadians. And um, hearing all of that information and trying to balance it. And I think we don't always do a great job in articulating back out all of the things that went into our decision making process. And so I think there are lots of opportunities to, to continue dialogue and, and learn that stuff. So, um, yeah, and then, and then the only other thing I was going to raise, and I, I'm going to dig it out here somewhere, there was a we received a presentation, I think it was two years ago at the First Nations Fisheries Council uh, Annual General Assembly, um, put on by someone from one of the Southern nations, I believe, about uh, reconciling Indigenous law with Canadian law and some of the things that they had learned when looking at it. Um, because if I remember correctly from that uh, presentation, a lot of the core values are the same. You know what I mean? And so it's just how you get to those core values. So. One of the questions, I think I had a couple of questions um, on comments that you, you put forward, Amy. Um, it's on several instances uh, you've uh, put regulations in on the um, on the Skeena River mm -hmm. based on conservation mm -hmm. measures and. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking to myself here, um, a lot of times um, any kind of jurisdiction on the, on the rivers or provincial lands and waters, that the province has that jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. and, uh, however, you're saying that um, because of conservation measures, you're able to make changes to those laws. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, and if I get it totally wrong, I'm gonna ask Juanita to okay. to chime in because she. So it's, it's a real it's a real big issue that yeah I'm, I'm not familiar with. Okay. I'm not, it okay. Would really help us to understand. Okay, I'm gonna do my best recognizing this is a layman's version of of fisheries law 101. <laughs> um, so essentially, all of our uh, regulations are. Um, But we were just talking about this in the car this morning. Um, essentially, when a fishery gets opened, uh, like the recreational fishery is opened by variation order, is what it's called under under the fishery gen regs, right? Yeah, see, I'm sorry, getting right under the fishery general regulations. So those are regulations. Who's, who's, who's fishery general regulations? Um, so Province or the feds? That's federal. Federal. Okay. So salmon, okay. salmon only. Okay. okay. Salmon only. So. Anything that comes from the ocean, except for swimmer, <laughs> salmon only is is us. Okay. That's us. Um, and anything that is freshwater or steelhead, yeah, that. that's the province. That. So, so, so what happens is we submit a variation order to have 
um, I don't think it's actually changing the regulations, you're varying what's already in the regulations. So where the regulations may have an open time normally from such and such a date to such and such a date, we vary them for that season to be different. And that's in effect until that variation order expires. Um, so that's the way that that works. Now, however, we can only do that for the salmon species. So when it's other, other, other species, we work with the province to try to see if we both agree that it's the same conservation concern and what are the impacts from, uh, you know, because you're gonna have an instance of encounters of those salmon when people are fishing for trout, it could happen. Um, you can't really uh, enforce gear type, like when someone's fishing out on the river and you're like, that person's using a Chinook bait or Chinook gear, it's, it's a hard <coughs> one to charge for. So, so we work with the province to, to mirror their orders. So they've approached us about mirroring their drought management if they move ahead with that, same as we approached them this year about putting no fishing in those trips to protect the Chinook, spawning Chinook. Does that make a little bit more sense? Yeah. <laughs> so it's who makes the variation order? Who writes the variation who order? Who does it? Uh, the, our, um, set our recreational manager writes the variation order. And who would that be? Uh, his name's Darren Chow. Darren Chow. Darren Chow? Yeah. His manager reviews it, who's Sandra Davies, who is our salmon manager. And when he's here, we can get him to describe this in much more detail. We'll write that down as an action. Um, and then I approve them. And you approve it. I approve it. And Whoa. It, yeah. And it goes to our regulations unit. And then I don't know what happens to it after that. I don't know how. I'd have to check how the authority has been delegated. So the way that it works, like the, the Minister of Fisheries and Oceans is responsible for everything under the Fisheries Act and the Oceans Act and, um, and various other pieces of legislation. But the minister delegates their authority on different things. And so sometimes I may be able to approve something as the, not as the minister, but my position would be authorized to approve things. Sometimes it's the regional director general. So the regional, regional director general can open and close commercial fisheries. Um, recreational fisheries, it depends. Sometimes she does it. It depends on kind of if it's coast wide or if it's an area based. So it really varies based on the decision, but that's how the authorities are kind of laid out. So could we get that on, online, this stuff? Or somewhere online? Uh, I don't know. Around how to do a variation order? What, what did you how say yeah, that what the process is found on this? I've never seen that. Yeah, I think like, maybe we'll put that as an action. Like we could, it, with given yeah. some time, I could do this a little bit better. This yeah, is a very, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, I know, it's, yeah. Good, it's a good summary. Sharing, sharing procedure. I'm also getting you know? it completely wrong. My husband's a fishery officer. He may be appalled by what I'm <laughs> saying <laughs> right now. <laughs> sometimes something like that that can be explained in five or ten minutes just helps put a frame of reference around everything else yeah. we're trying yeah. to talk about, right? Like, how do we have to do our jobs? Yeah. And it's pretty prescriptive. And, yeah. Um, yeah. and that gives us a better under understanding of the regulatory toolbox that you guys yes. are working yeah. with. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the, similar process that the province has asked nations and stakeholders to come up with like potential uh, regulation changes like making a window of fishing shorter or yeah. something like that my question always is is like everything is based on science is there any science to show that if any of these changes are made what is the response by the fishery? Like, is there a positive response to the fishery? Like, what, what does it really mean, or is it just sort of token, right? Yeah, no, exactly. And, and as an example, so last year we put these measures in place, and we also, I believe, had uh, no fishing for Chinook in the marine for a certain period of time, because we were anticipating really low returns of Chinook, just based on some stuff we were seeing. And uh, as I understand it, um, you know, the nations further upriver were able to harvest Chinook. So. In, a, in numbers that we probably maybe didn't think we'd see. So is that a sign of success? Probably a little bit, but it's not quantifiable, right? Like it's it's more kind of observation of trends and and things like that. But I, you know, in some of our other fisheries like groundfish and whatnot, we have a real 
stringent you know, management strategy evaluation where you pick your management measures, you figure out how you're gonna evaluate their effectiveness and you have that feedback loop mm -hmm. happening all the time. I know it's something I've asked because that was the first fishery I was ever introduced to. And so with Sam and I'm like, well, we're putting all these measures in place. Like, how will we know if they're successful? And what are the objectives? And, and have, like, 10 changes and be like, okay, this one actually works. Yeah, we'll and sometimes, you know, to be honest, sometimes it's, it's trial and error. Let's see if this works. Like, you know, what happens? A lot of these variation orders, um, for example, uh, the SFAB puts forth motions about what, you know, might be options because they get presented with where there are concerns as well. And they have an interest in seeing these fisheries last into perpetuity as well. And so they put forth motions that say, you know what, we're let's cut the bag limits or let's let's do this measure this year. So a lot of the conservation measures that you actually see each year are motions they have put forward. Motions by who? By the Sport Fish Advisory Board. So Is we there an opportunity for nations to be putting in that kind of feedback loop? I guess it would be through our engagement on on the piece, the way that we manage for salmon, well, sockeye specifically, it's not quite as clear cut with everything else, but sockeye, um, the way that we uh, kind of manage for the priority is to take that allocation off the top. So when you look in the in the integrated fisheries management plan, which lays out kind of the plan for the year, it'll talk about a threshold of um, 800,000 before we would open up recreational fishing. It talks about a threshold of 1.05 million before you would open up commercial fishing. And then it talks about a minimum escapement of 400,000, where if we started to approach that, we'd be a little bit worried and we start having the conversations with nations about what does this look like. And so that's what happened in 2013 when the nations came together and proposed um, <coughs> rolling closures in 2013. Um, in 2017, the nations actually came together and recommended that we, we increase that threshold to 625,000 for food fisheries. And we as the department, you know, we said, we're, we don't have any science to bump it beyond 400. We think that food fishing can happen at 400, um, but the nations were pretty adamant. And that's what we were talking about one of our first meetings when, you know, we talked about uh, the Gitsan Watershed authorities asking people to not fish. That was a, a First Nations number that they picked, that 625,000 as the technical folks based on what they were seeing. And they'll explain it better than me. It has to do with wild stocks and different yeah, well, small trips. With, with the gigs and you have yeah. a problem because uh, our law says no, no catch and release yeah. and also no wasted chain. Yeah. Catching the females and yeah. letting them sink in the river yeah. is a wastage. Yeah. So somehow you're gonna have to reconcile that. Yeah. So I think we're, we're finally now, after all these months, we're starting to get down. What you just yeah. said that is perfect and interesting and makes gives us confidence that you do have a process, eh? So could we get into that in more detail how you do your variation orders? Yeah, for sure, yeah, we can, I'll make sure at the next meeting uh, that either, well, Darren's coming. Yeah. I was mentioning to Brian, and we'll bring it up. Um, Darren is really uncomfortable with the idea of being videotaped, so well, we can talk about that. We could shut it off. Yeah, okay, and, uh, but I also, I'll talk with Sandra, you know, and I learned from Juanita that in shellfish, they have a really great description of how fisheries management happens and so I'm trying to get something like that for salmon about and Colin did a bit of a presentation that he gave um, to a local rod and gum, gun club in Smithers I think so I was looking at it and I'm like it's mostly pictures so um, but you know I would really like to you know have an opportunity at a future meeting to kind of describe to you guys how our management works because it may give you confidence it may make you more worried um, but but just to understand some of what we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis yeah it you makes me worry. There's this Darren and then there's yep. a Davies fella. Sandra Davies. Sandra? So Sandra is our, um, she's our, our salmon section head. She's also the person that I am sharing the acting area director with. So she'll do it in the four months following me. So I, okay. I really want to get her here to meet you guys. She just wasn't able to come today. Okay. And then you do the approval. Yes. So we like that. Yeah. So I, That's I, a new I, thing. I just started that last week. I'm like, oh, sure, approved. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I trust. So we could see that uh, the regulatory, it's jackets. called the regulatory toolbox, eh? Yeah. So we could see now how you do it. And then now I can understand what Doug Donaldson was getting at when he appointed Troy. The management Troy side Lyden. of things, yes. And then he's avoiding coming out. Maybe he doesn't want my video. <laughs> <laughs> but 
given all that, there's gaps in there that this government can can fill in, and we feel that uh, we can do things that you're not able to do, and uh, maybe not. Mm -hmm. And uh, but we're risky. We like to we like to do stuff. So and we're risk averse. So, <laughs> but, <laughs> but we're so, trying. We're trying to find ways. So we're starting to bring the two together. I could see us starting to gel now. Okay. Yeah. You know, uh, I really like this uh, forum, uh, what we're doing here. It's sort of like a round table. It's not, it's not restrictive, you know, and th therefore things come forward. Um, okay. You mentioned the process. Um, uh, how, how much of this is policy that you're talking about? And um, it, it seems like from, from the process, there's a lot of discretionary um, um, power which is used to make these decisions. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I, when I, I mentioned this before that um, policies are not law. Mm -hmm. And, and when, when you have an opening where discretionary power comes in, that's where um, the friends of fisheries, they get they get preferential treatment like Patterson, mm -hmm. you know, fishing up on Batling Lake, uh, uh, fishing on the ocean, uh, canning um, millions of uh, cans, you know. So, you know, and, and you're going to explain this, right? Uh, at uh, when when you do, and I think I think that's going to be really good because um, this conversation that we're having. It's the best conversation that we've ever had. You know, it opens a lot of doors. Uh, you know, it frees up a lot of our our worries. You know, and our stress. Mm -hmm. You know, so. Thank you. We, you know, it's interesting. We've actually talked about that a lot. Uh, Colin and I would muse about it before he left, <laughs> before he decided to retire. Um, about how you know, it's one of the things that we don't do a really great job at is reminding people about all the things DFO considers in our in our management and you know that meeting that he went to in Smithers was an example of where he just you know maybe once a year once every two years just reminding people of all of the pieces and have we got it right are we missing things and it's one of the things I really want to explore with our um, you know we work in partnership with a lot of the First Nations te technical groups and they understand that process so can we work together to do community meetings and and uh, you know, share those perspectives and, and things like that. So it's it's something we've talked about a lot, but you know, one of the challenges we are running into with this all of these uh, relationships that we're trying to build is, of course, resources, and so we're trying to figure that out too. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna run. I should be in the meeting. Oh, okay. You mean you're lunch? lunch? Yeah. I'm gonna see if we can. You were so excited about lunch. <laughs> they don't feed us over there. <laughs> So, hope you guys fix a good day in August. It's going to be exciting. Okay. Thanks, Gordon. So, if we were to have this meeting, the next meeting, revolving around regulatory toolbox, is that sort of the vibe we're getting, or is it with the? Well, I guess it depends how we do it, right? And and so we've made, we've talked about a couple things that we want to talk about we want to talk with the rec sector and introduce each other and get to know each other and understand each other a little bit yep. um, with perhaps an opportunity if it works out for the folks from the Fraser to tell us what, how what they learned through their process because I think that would be valuable for everybody to hear including the rec mm -hmm. sector we've talked about the regulatory piece um, and understanding you know kind of how DFO works um, and how our decision-making processes and advisory processes work, like how we get information from the SFAC, how we get, and there's a whole, I didn't even mention the Integrated Harvest Planning Committee yet. Um, now these, I will mention that the Integrated Harvest Planning Committee, that's where everybody comes together. There's a, a big one uh, that happens in Vancouver and it brings the North and the South together. There are sport fish reps, there are, um, there are commercial reps, there are also uh, First Nations reps. Uh, Stu Barnes is actually, and Mark Cleveland are the two reps for the North, and they are uh, a, a handful of First Nations that are still participating in that process and, and contributing to it and, and whatnot. So um, 
I guess they would be the real real people for you to hear from about that process from a from a First Nations perspective and not me. Could I ask a question yeah. on, on the represent, representatives at that yes. in that particular meeting? Yeah. Are they are they technical or are they political? A little mishmash. A little bit so, a bit of everything. So I think so. So the technicians much. become or get the ability to make decisions? No, they're not making decisions. It's a it's an advisory process. Okay, so yeah. that, that's what I'm getting yeah. at is um, if they're going to be making this plan at this committee, then um, if I'm just, want, I'm, I'm just yeah. trying to see where they could um, make things happen. Yeah. You know, and uh, or or does this or is this just a group that gathers the information and then it gets funneled down to the minister? It is the I'm main. Thinking. Yeah, it is the main consultative body for <laughs> the creation of the integrated or fisheries management plan. Um, and so it's kind of a place where there's both preseason and postseason discussions about everything that's gone on. There's then a northern and a southern integrated harvest planning committee. And then as part of that, or kind of parallel to that, I guess, uh, and I think it's supported by the First Nations Fisheries Council, there are salmon coordinating committees for the north and the south. And so those are just First Nations representation. Again, ask, but again, is this, is, is this a political or technical group? You know, it's, I'm gonna be honest, it's kind of somewhere in the middle because they're talking about management. So we have a constant kind of back and forth within DFO about what's technical and what's management. For me, I have a hard time separating the two, but then, so in my brain, it's about management decisions right. based on right. based on all of these pieces. Yes. Not, when I think political, I think about people making a position that isn't necessarily based on well, all I, of the I, only, yeah. I only bring up political because uh, we, we have, have a huge concern on our standard. Mm -hmm. And our standard is making sure that we put food on our tables. Mm -hmm. It's not a it's not a law, it's a standard, it's what we do. Yeah. It's what our grandparents have done, it's what our parents have done, it's what we do today, it's what we carry on today. And uh, so that's why I I, I I pose so many curious, yeah, no. maybe dumb questions mm -hmm. to what um, these groups are are um, are putting on the table, yeah. and if, if those things are being uh, taken to the minister, then it, then to me it's, it's a political body. Yeah, yeah, and I guess in a way, it is, <coughs> I guess in a way, it is. It's the stakeholder forum for engagement, but some nations are participating at it. So I also heard you say. I, I just want to, don't yeah. want to lose this on my end here. Sure. I heard you say something with the, the sport fishery sector uh, is bringing stuff to the table and do we as indigenous communities have that opportunity? Yes. And, and yes, you do. Um, through, and it depends, different nations is different forums. So uh, we meet bilaterally with nations uh, all the time. Um, so the, the way that it works right now, so we also, and, and I will caveat this with, I know that there are mixed feelings on these things. Uh, we do issue under the Aboriginal Communal Fishing License Regulations, we do issue communal licenses to all of the nations. The one that gets issued for the Gitsan Nation is shared with Wet'suwet'en. I don't know why. Um, but there is, and so each year we issue that license, it includes allocations and things like that. And, and that's part of our management regime. That's kind of our, our, our way of knowing sort of how many licenses are out there and what kind of is coming out. Um, I will say that the Gitsan Watershed Authorities has one of the best um, monitoring programs uh, and we get the best, some of our most confident information from in the North Coast. Um, and so uh, we do issue that license. Each year when we issue that license, we do have a conversation with uh, Charlie Muldoon, who gets his um, his direction from Chief's Committee, I believe. I, I don't, I'm they still trying have, to figure out how this all fits together. A board, of a board of directors, yes. And uh, and so we engage on those. So that's one opportunity. Yeah. There's also um, the Skeena Fisheries Commission uh, has a board has a board of or commissioners has commissioners. They have uh, recently met with uh, the regional director general 
to explore what a better relationship could look like there as well. And so she's actually going to be coming up uh, in the in the fall probably to meet with them. And I'm I'm going to be recommending to to see if she can meet with you guys as well. So okay. I don't know if that'll swing, but I'll try. Who is that? Re Rebecca Reed. She's our regional director general. So she's oh, yeah. kind of like the boss for Pacific region. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Rebecca Reed. R E I E. So okay, if there's she's the regional director general. She reports to me. So there's an opportunity for her to come out too at that same time. I think that would be a great opportunity. But and, I, and she will be interested to understand how the work that's happening here interfaces with the work that the Skeena Fisheries Commission is doing and the work that the Gibson Watershed Authorities is doing. And I know I know we've brought that up a few times. So, uh, but I think we'll get there. I think we're getting there. We're figuring it out, right? So what kind of protocol would you be? Would be you'd be you the one to enter? <laughs> Would we all stand? I just like to Big call hugs. her Rebecca. I like to call her Rebecca. My friend yeah. laughs when I call her the RBG. Yeah. She's a. Uh, we, we, we don't get to say Becky. No, no, <laughs> she's a Rebecca. She's a Rebecca. Rebecca used to be uh, an area director in the Central Coast. And she so. started life in Prince Rupert. Yeah, she started life in Prince Rupert. Probably, I think everybody started yeah. life in Prince Rupert. We all started in Prince Rupert. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, I think when we're on the road to looking at a tribunal, I think um, I, I like the idea that both of you are very consistent with the federal, federal, federal and, uh, and I think we'd like to see the same with the clouds. And, um, like we were having a bit of smooth sailing for a year and then change players and we don't know who the players are and we have to bring them up to speed and, and, I, don't, and I don't think it would be very productive to to have that kind of a pattern and uh, I think uh, I think it's so important to have consistency and, uh, mm -hmm. and I think hopefully when we meet with the province um, <coughs> We don't want them to walk out of here in a month, in a, in a year, and then then we bring somebody else in and we have to start all over again. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Robert? There's one question we keep asking, got no answer. Okay. Who monitors the recreational fishery? As you heard Chad says, they go around the corner, cut the salmon open, just take the roll and throw them in. That's got to be a monitor. Because years ago, uh, Russell Stevens and uh, his crew, I used to help my partner, food fish. Mm -hmm. They asked us what kind of fish we got, how many, and where. Mm -hmm. So they're monitoring our trying to preserve our fishery. So the same should uh, apply to the feds in the BC with the recreational fishing. Somebody has to do, for all we know, like recreational fishing is playing with fish in our life, in our eyes, and that's taboo. And to just, I noticed some uh, Sad to say, there's one native. You should take just the fish belly, and cut it off, and fish still alive to throw them back in. So that's got to be the same way with recreational. Somebody has to monitor them, and I don't think that's a role for GWA. It's got to be from the feds or BC. We keep asking this, we've got no answer. So maybe uh, one of you could bring it to the government. Yeah. And, and perhaps we can uh, we can talk about that in more depth at that call of the rec sector, because I yeah. think that's part of theirs. But uh, just to, to clarify, the GWA is only monitoring the food fishery for the Kitsan. Um, there are various tools in place to monitor the recreational fishery. 
Uh, we do have creels in some locations where that is, they come to the dock and they, they give their information. Uh, they do overflights uh, in the marine to count boats and it, it gives them a, a sense as kind of, of who's out there. Uh, and then we also have um, IRAC, which is a, is a, uh, it's, a it's, it's random, right? Random who they target. Uh, so if I buy a sport fish license, I will get, I might get an email that asks me to submit my catch. And what they're doing is they're trying to calibrate that with the creel to see how, how, how consistent the information is that it spits out. And, and my understanding is that for salmon, it's pretty, pretty good. Um, so that's another tool that's in place right now. And then we're working with the Sport Fish Institute uh, to, cause they're the ones that developed IRAC to figure out different ways to get people to record where their catch is and stuff. I know for the, for the shellfish species, you can actually put in exactly where you caught it, how big it was. So kind of exploring that because everybody's walking around with one of these now and uh, for most people and uh, they can plug in their catch and you get a signal almost everywhere now. So trying to explore new technology and Lots ways to, yeah. But the waste of fish is a big Oh yeah, the waste of fish is a big like, one. And that's so, a recording just straight LRR. Yeah, we do have the observe, observe record report line. Um, it's actually in my wallet. I, I know Matt Lakatla Fisheries mm -hmm. put out a card to all of their members so that when they saw things, we don't want people to engage and put themselves in danger, but to call that number and report what they're seeing. Yeah, it just seems like uh, from the province and feds on on that side of things, on having boots on the ground, it's it's slim to none. Mm -hmm. um, if you go fish anywhere on the Skeena watershed, it'll be a, a nation guardian or a nation fisheries tech that would be the one coming up and talking to you. I think that's a good investment from the province in Canada. Yeah, that is the unfortunate reality. Live and breathe it down south as well. Um, what we do ask is that you use the reporting line whenever you see anything that looks to be inappropriate because what happens is the more reports come from an area or for a particular reason, the more quickly the fish officers are able to respond based on the number of reports. Um, yeah, yeah, um, it's never perfect, yeah. but eyes on the water are better than, yeah. than what and, we have. And that system sounds like an honor system, which... Yeah. All right, so I'm, I'm coming aware of the time and I'm coming aware uh, that we have another one of our chiefs has to leave at lunchtime and he's going to miss out on lunch, but... <laughs> I, I want to... Um, so, so we... We sort of have an agenda, an agenda for the next meeting. Uh, sport, sport fishermen and uh, Derek Chow and whoever our others will be there. Uh, maybe a, something on the Fraser River uh, project. And uh, I think we also, uh, Gordon expressed to me that the variation of weather that uh, you touched on briefly could be elaborated on. Yeah. It's really of interest from, um, from this table. Yeah, I wrote down the regulatory toolbox, monitoring, kind of understanding how the rec yeah. fishery operates. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think that would yeah, be good. It, it feels like there's there's a need for two meetings. Yeah, I think so. There's I agree. There's a need for a meeting for this introductory meeting for the fisheries advisory board, Karen, and, and all these um, moving parts on that front. The rec pieces. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's that's a meeting in itself, and then another meeting would be this regulatory toolbox. What the tool, bigger record? Yeah, like what are you guys working with? What where does our nation's feedback come into play? Where does our concerns come into play? And where do we go if we want to see a desired change? Where's the closest person that we can go to to talk about that? Like who's the statutory yeah. decision makers? And then also, I think it's a really good opportunity to get the province back on the table. Um, we can invite Troy to come and speak to the regulatory levers and, and that sort of thing. What if we did a DFO 101? I, we, did a, yeah. we did a Get San 101. What if we did a DFO, DFO 101? It, it, it strikes me, and we've done this quite often um, with some of the groups I work with in, out of Nanaimo on Micro Island, where I can actually pull it off in a couple of hours, uh, a really basic sort of who we are, how we all work together. 
but more important than that is where do you contribute in that annual life cycle that is DFO. And there are, I could pick four points in a circle right now that would help you understand how to contribute to the processes that are government and, and, what, and how important that is. I'm almost thinking we, we could almost have the, the DFO and the province 101 piece during the day, and maybe we just have a special invitation to the SRC to come the in evening. in the evening for an hour or two. Sure. Like, it could almost be, it would be a really long day, but it actually might be a really good. And then I'm also wondering if there would be an openness, and I'll leave this with you guys, I don't expect you to answer right now, to invite uh, the GWA and the Skeena Fish Commission to the DFO 101. Yeah, yeah sure. That's been done, the GWA invited them. Uh, from our meeting yesterday. Oh, to the kids. Um, Robin? I think this would be a really good opportunity when Jasper was talking about for uh, to have maybe like two to three meetings per month. But yeah, I know you guys are very busy, but this is uh, very important that we get. I would really love the information today. It was very uh, useful and more knowledge. Come in my own head, and I'm sure everybody else here too. And uh, this is a good opportunity to get even more information. Mm -hmm. so, um, if we can, um, we, we should. I, I'm thinking. You, I guess uh, you could say that um, rather than having a really long day, you could break them into two. Yeah. Like um, two, half days. two half days, you yeah. know? Yeah. One after each other, you know? Yeah. Because, something, um, something that we can work on. Because yeah. this is a breakthrough, and uh, yes. I think that we should uh, take, do, do yeah. take this yes. opportunity yes. to, um, because, you know, we are working together. Mm -hmm. I, um, I, will, I will flag, um, not to be the negative person, but uh, right now is really kind of our manager's busiest time. They are, they are like run ragged, managing fisheries and, and doing all of their stuff, and so, um, the more we can kind of like, I would love to meet two or three times a month, but it's just not going to be feasible in, in July, August. Uh, so if we can kind of look for a date a little bit later, I think I, that way I can make sure I get them here. You know what I mean? And I think uh, Juanita and I'll have to go back and check dates. So if we could maybe pick one or two or three okay. dates uh, for this, <coughs> this uh, DFO 101, and then I know you guys are going to keep working on the rec meeting. I just don't want to over, overwork people. They already get worried when I come back from meetings. They're like, I guess what we're going to do now. <laughs> I'm not popular. <laughs> Join the crowd. Yeah, I know. But there's a couple key people that I would want to bring to this DFO 101 That would meeting. make it the most effective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, I, I know we, I think our pro one of the main priorities right now, I know that a lot of this is, is groundbreaking as was put forward here. But the sport fishery sector yeah. is is key in my mind, and um, and we did mention um, if here is too far, we could uh, meet in a central place. I think Terrace was uh, suggested, and uh, we're we're open to that. So my next uh, thought is, uh, what date would you would you suggest for the sport fish one? Yes, I'm gonna leave that 100% with Juanita. To work out those dates with, uh, okay. So right now it was the week of uh, the twenty second. Um, August. July. July. That meeting would be able to pull off faster. Okay. But it depends. So if we could leave that with Winita okay. to work back and forth with you guys. All right. So the the suggestion right now is looking at the week of uh, the twenty second of July, which is two weeks from now. Me to the sport fishery, and that could be a relatively short meeting. Yeah, yeah. Because if it's a meet and greet, sort of introduce each other. Uh, yeah. We can do it over a uh, dinner or something. That would people like to eat. Uh, <laughs> well, nobody throws food. Where can we throw food? <laughs> <laughs> Watching you. <laughs> Um, that's good. That's good. That week sometime. That work? Mm-hmm. 22nd. Yeah. 
That's yeah. weird. We will caveat. We will have to check with Darren's availability of course, of course, and nurse yeah. and the other guys. So let us know. But we'll get back to you pretty quickly to get those dates out. And then maybe for the uh, DFO 101, if we could look, maybe that can be our August meeting. Yes. Um, August gets a little complicated. <laughs> this is when all our fish managers are burnt out and they take leave. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so I'm, I'm not here in the middle of August. Yeah, I'm not same. here at the end of the month. Same. August. Maybe early September might be. Yeah. August, August. beginning of August. Yeah, maybe we're looking into September once school gets yeah. back in. Yeah, maybe okay. September. August. What about the middle of August? I'll uh, be here. I'll be here. You'll be here. I'll, I'll, I'll be, be on here leave. If, if you can't chair the meeting at that time. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. For sure, for sure. Yeah. So, sure. I am away from the 9th to the 19th, and then my salmon manager is away from the 20th till the 30th. So, Sam, August is pretty ugly for us. What about um, before uh, the 9th? Yeah, so we're going to have a meeting on the 9th. Yeah, we're going to have a meeting on the 9th. So, you're, you're looking at between the 5th and the 8th? The 5th is a holiday. 5th more 5th is a holiday? Yeah. There's holidays? Okay, it's that August day. Yeah. Well, that okay. August, what do they BC call it? BC day. BC day in BC this country, day. or in this province? <laughs> I'm from Ontario. <laughs> in Ontario it's called that. something else. No, I'm still a newbie. You uh, guys mentioned the weekends or nights? For the rec sector. Oh, oh that's Yeah, for the rec sector. I can come during the day. Yeah. Okay, let me look, let me look during the week of August 6th. Okay. And uh, I'll get back to you. I'll shoot an email to you, uh, these guys right away. In. Okay. So, Sandra and Darren. So, just to be clear, uh, we need to be looking at the July 22nd <coughs> potential. We, we, yeah. That week. And that's for the sports sector. Yeah. And the August 6th could be the uh, DFO 101. And we still need to assign where we can put the Fraser River and the variation orders or the regulatory box in there somewhere. Yeah. And that would be part of the DFO 101. Would, would it? it be? Yeah. Well, I think if we're going to have the Fraser people come talk, it would be good to do that with the rec sector. Yeah. So maybe that's a future meeting. Okay. You know what I mean? Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Maybe we can propose that at that meeting and see if there's an openness from them as well to explore that. And that'll give Ernie more time to work okay. on his feet. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm actually thinking for that meeting the week of August, I would actually have Sandra and then uh, one of our, uh, if there's interest, having one of our conservation and protection officers attend as well. Okay. Because they would be, they know our regulatory toolbox pretty well. So we can talk about that. So if, if we do have one August uh, 6th, would that uh, take the place of uh, the next CMT? Yeah. It is. I think so, yeah. It's all part of our relationship yeah. Yeah. here is okay. to figure things out. Yeah. It would all be CMT. Yeah. 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 Because you'd be bringing this back to the coverage team. Yeah. yeah. All right. That's great. Any yeah. other yeah. comments? Really good. We're excited. We'll see how my staff feel when I get back. And I'm like, <laughs> so. <laughs> so I, I think this is, as from my point of view, this has been a. A real um, enriching meeting. I think uh, you've shared a lot, Amy and Juanita, and I believe we've all we've continued to share with you uh, where our um, our standards are, and that's our on or not, and um, and what the Semiyet uh, here have shared with you comes from their hearts, because this is what we do. This is where we live. This is how we live. So uh, I, I know lunch is here, so I would like to ask uh, Denise Kimenu to um, close the meeting and bless the food. Close? Yes. Don't take too long. <laughs> He's like, I still have things to say. <laughs> <laughs> Write them down for next time. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Oh, Shalim, the word of Shamal, the Mahai. 
Grab some lunch. Okay. Hey, please. Thank you. Thank you for feeding us. Oh, God.